I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector Podcast. And I have joining me returning guest and uh, regular contributor, Chris Temple of the National Investor. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, Mike. How are you today? I'm doing well. So today we're going to do something. Yeah, it's kind of in line with what we do, but we're going to focus more on it. Uh, there is an election coming up in your country. It is literally too close to call. Uh, up and down the ballot, including the presidential election. Um, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity for us to kind of take a look at uh, everything in kind of generalities leaving, leading up to the election, what could happen post-election, uh, given one side or another a mixed bag of results, and what we think it's going to mean for the economy going forward. Um, we're going to be pragmatic about it. Uh, we're not uh, here to handicap the race as to uh, who's going to win. We're we're going to take a look and say if this happens, this is likely. If that happens, that that is likely. So um, those those I guess are our ground rules, uh, Chris. So uh, let's start things off. Uh, what kind of a mess is the economy in going into this election? Well, that is a good initial question, and I want to answer that with a historical example. Uh, just this week, uh, the U.S. celebrated the 100th birthday of the only U.S. president to ever make it to be a centenarian, and that, of course, was James Earl Carter. And probably not since then, with the possible exception of 2008, when we'd had a financial crisis and economic debacle that, that that greeted Barack Obama when he was elected back then. But with that possible exception, we haven't had a situation where the deck was so stacked against whoever the next president is going to be as, as, as it is today. You know, in 1976, we had inflation, which had been tamed once, was starting to roar back and for the next few years, we had double-digit inflation. Finally, when Carter found the right man to run the Federal Reserve, at least for a while, Paul Volcker, who finally tamped that down, uh, we had double-digit inflation, double-digit interest rates, et cetera. And to this day, Jimmy Carter is blamed for that occurring on his watch when he had very, very little to do with it. Uh, especially if you're a gold bug, you know from history that the inflation of the 1970s was the creation of Richard Nixon and his Fed chairman, Arthur Burns. Uh, Nixon, by taking us off the gold standard and then unleashing Burns on the world, who debauched the dollar and caused the inflation of that era back then. So today we're coming off the most outlandish creation of new money in recorded history, meaning what Jerome Powell did in the wake of the COVID pandemic. Uh, he takes some of that back in the last couple of years by raising interest rates. Now he's going in the other direction. But we still have this massive overhang of too much credit in a system, inflation that is still going to prove to be sticky in more places than not, an economy that has gone apeshit because of all of that credit, and now there's going to be a continued drop in demand for an awful lot of things. You and I have talked about that a lot, where a lot of consumers are already feeling a recession. So there is nothing right out of the gate that either political party, either presidential candidate is going to be able to do to stop the train that is already on the track, taking us to recession and to more of the great stagflation. The challenge for both of them is going to be to figure out what they can do to mitigate those forces that are already in play and make them less bad. And that will, you know, there'll be differences in policies. Some might work, some might not. It involves taxes, trade, uh, nationalism, uh, mercantilism, our, our own industrial base, a whole host of things. But that's where we're starting from is that, uh, you quipped to me before, and I think you're right, you know, if, if either one of these people, whether it's Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, 
could could really understand and get their heads around the mess that we're in. Do they really want to be president and inherit what's going to be a, a, a pretty a long, dull ache? Yeah, uh, that's a great uh, history uh, analogy of, of the Carter uh, years because, yeah, I think whoever the the next president is, is they're going to be kind of faced with a, a four-year term very similar to what Jimmy Carter had where um, there's going to be a lot of things going wrong and the buck stops, at, you know, in the Oval Office and uh, – they're going to take a lot of blame for stuff that's already cooked into the cake right now. That's right. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting times, as I like to uh, like to refer to them. Uh, we are we are heading into an election, as we as we discussed. There is a very good chance um, that we end up with a, a, a mixed bag coming out of this where no one party has control over all three houses the you know the presidency the uh, the senate or congress in fact uh, as we spoke off off mic I, I suggested that uh you could see both houses flip congress go back to the democrats and the senate go back to the to the republicans and and as i say the the presidency is at a at a toss up Given the challenging times that, that's going to be coming in and the fact that everybody has been so partisan for so long, uh, do you see that being an end of the partisanship and you start to see the, you know, the two parties trying to work together to actually solve problems or uh, are these problems that were already, you know, baked in the cake, are they going to get worse because they, they can't? get out of their their corners and stop bickering. Well, here again, the the landscape that we're going to have no matter the outcome, no matter this mix, Mike, is an economy that is stagnating, a 2 plus trillion dollar annualized deficit that is going to go up because of that, because of a weaker economy, lower tax receipts, less growth, etc. So that that's that's what's going to greet whoever comes in and you know, you would think that in a rational, half-enlightened society with responsible people, that yes, people, no matter what the end ending mix is after the election, that they would bury the hatchet where they can and say, okay, the U.S. is in trouble. We've got stiff competition from other countries. We cannot compete still with China, for example, on a host of things. We still need resources from all over the world that we that we either can't get or if we do get them it keeps our own domestic industries and mothballs all of this has got to change and you know I, I listened to a really good discussion after the last fed meeting when you know you and I get together every time after the fed meets well the first commentator they bring on CNBC afterward is Jeffrey Gunlock of double line partners uh, he's one of the more noted, uh, you know, pretty smart and understated macroeconomists, interest rate and bond market experts. And he put it well, you know, and, and, and you and I can talk a little bit about what the differences are in the various tax and trade and growth proposals of, you know, between uh, Trump and Harris. But what he said is that especially when we're going into a time when debt is so going to choke the economy the federal debt is so going to take oxygen out of the room and, and take up a, a lion's share of the available capital that won't be going to business. These candidates have to figure out, and the government, after all the dust settles, has to figure out, what do we do, all else being equal, to broaden the tax base and to increase output? Because the only way you at least keep plodding along through a weakening economy and rising deficits is you have to invigorate growth enough to where the sheer numbers of output go up enough to where, yes, you're still going to have inflation. It's going to be different forms no matter who wins. But at least if you have increased output, be it by you know broadening out our energy mix uh, infrastructure programs, whatever. And there's been some, I, I got to admit, there's been some really interesting 
proposals from both Harris and Trump about what they would do to lead exactly to that. That's what's going to have to be focused on, you know, because you're either going to have inflationary modest growth or you're going to have what China right now is desperately fighting, and that is outright deflation and contraction. And that sure as hell doesn't help you service debt. And they're finding that out. No, no. And the American debt has just, uh, I want to say balloon, but that's that's not even a, a good description because over the the last two terms of presidency, it's like it's been like a, a giant explosion in debt. Um, and, and it is crippling. Um, and if we're going into an economic slowdown, as you and I have discussed, you know, when we t we put the eye test to the data, the data doesn't make sense when we're seeing the effects actually on Main Street and regular folk out there who are, are struggling to make ends meet. You know, they're, you know, they're driving Ubers, they're running Airbnbs um, just in order to keep a roof over their head and food on their tables. That's not a sign of a good, uh, you know, healthy economy. What... You know, let's let's start there. Let's uh, let's start with what the two different camps have, are proposing that are going to start to stimulate the economy. Because uh, um, as it sits right now, I can't see where they could just throw a bunch of money at it because they don't have it. Well, no, I mean, look, and and we have the regrettable example of you know the that COVID period where. The government ran up several trillion dollars more in debt just by giving people money to stay home with a mask on their face and do nothing. That's the last thing you want to do. I mean, in the future, whatever the government does to add to the debt level has got to be at least at least be productive. And like Dunlock pointed out, at least if you're going to have some kind of a stimulus thing, make it count. I mean, you know, rebuild roads and schools and bridges and and. And uh, our our communications infrastructure and our electric grid and and all of these different things that need to be done. Um, there's been a little bit of talk about that. You know, Donald Trump has suggested, for instance, that the U.S. needs to have a sovereign wealth fund. And I don't know if I would agree with that specifically, but he's getting warm. He's getting warm. Uh, Kamala Harris has come out with what would shock some people who only watched a little bit of you know headlines on Fox. But she's come out with a fairly interesting industrial policy, part of which involves setting up strategic reserves for all manner of minerals, not just oil and uranium, like what we have now. Uranium, of course, being a recent development, as most people know, but things like lithium and nickel and stuff that we mine little or none of in this country. And, you know, if, so if you believe her, then that's up to the, you know, the, the, the listener, but you know, she's going to completely undo what her partner has done for the last three and a half years, by and large. And she wants to see mining and whatnot done in this country for green energy and infrastructure and other needs. So, you know, those are those are talking points for when people are running for president. They don't matter until you get to pass next January and these things start becoming proposals. They start becoming bills in Congress by whoever the winner's political party is that starts to introduce these things. But I, I, I'm guardedly optimistic, Mike, that there's at least some acknowledgement of these needs and of the fact that, especially now that the economy is slowing, we're going into recession, there's going to need to be something to mitigate the effects of the overhang of debt and, and the slowing economy. And, and really at the top of everybody's list needs to be infrastructure, the power grid, et cetera. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But they're both talking about it behind the scenes. You don't hear it on MSNBC or Fox News a whole lot, um, but but it's there. And there needs to be a whole lot more of it. There needs to be a lot more talk about this. Yeah, and both ideas are actually interesting ideas. Like I, I see uh, from the Trump side of things that the, the sovereign uh, – uh, fund. I, I see that as an opportunity to, if you're going to build a mine, uh, a mine is multi millions of dollars to to be built. And if you have a sovereign fund, you can invest that fund and build build the mine within within your own countries. 
Um, if you need to uh, redo the, you know, the utility boards, the sovereign fund can, you know, provide, uh, you know, small modular reactors as an example uh, to to do that. So I, I see that as kind of a, an extension of one of the conversations you and I have had with regards to the uh, the infrastructure bank. But at the same time, and, and then this goes to the Harris's policy, it's it's fine to say we're going to have strategic reserves of all these these minerals, but you still have to mine them. And I'm not certain that America or even Canada, where I'm sitting in, you know, we're a friendly neighbor. Um, we have the workforce to actually do that. So there's got to have to be a plan for workforce training. And I'm not seeing that from either side. Well, no, and that, and that's even more the details that need to be added to such proposals as this. And, and it underscores the fact that for way too long, the U.S. primarily, maybe Canada to a lesser extent, uh, has just assumed that everything is going to fall into place, and it doesn't. You know, I, earlier this spring, I was at a conference, and a um, really smart guy from Arizona, Adam Hawkins, uh, I think you know who he is, Mike. Mm -hmm. Um, he was on a panel that I did with Ryan Sistad of Better in Our Backyard, and we were talking specifically about copper. And people re know, of course, most of them that listen to this broadcast know that uh, the long-term fundamentals for copper are just mind-blowing as far as the amount of demand there is in the next 20, 30, 40 years and, and how the industry globally is not remotely ready to meet that demand. So so you've got a very bullish setup for the metal and, and, and you've got a setup which should be lighting a fire underneath these policymakers. But one of the points he made is that, and I'm going to paraphrase it and shorten it for time's sake, but he said, if, if tomorrow, if you could snap your finger and tomorrow, Resolution and the other couple of major development stage copper mines in Arizona were able to start producing, they still can't. Because, and, and he, he went into the details of the breakdown of this, but he said, basically, you need a skilled workforce of 3,000 people total for these three copper mines, and we don't have the people. So you're exactly right. I mean, I, I, I sometimes cynically say that, that, you know, people have been taught, you know, how to carry a protest sign and other useful stuff to go to when they go to college these days. Nobody is training engineers and miners and, and this type of, of, of profession. And this is something that we should have been starting years ago foreseeing the mess that we were going to be in today. We're going to have to play catch up. We're going to have to play it fast. It's not going to come fast. It's not going to come easily. And we're going to go through a lot more pain until we get it right because we're going to have shortages of a lot of these materials. And especially if, you know, the makeup of the next government in Washington is antagonistic toward the rest of the world with tariffs and whatever else you want to talk about or war, you know, um, the rest of the country just says, well, go to hell. I mean, Russia recently has suggested that they would cut off exports of uranium, nickel, and titanium to, to the U.S., all three of which we still import from that country, and all three of which we are not yet remotely ready to replace with our own domestic production. Uh, no, no. And, you know, that's the other, you know, question that uh, has to crop up, uh, be it through the, you know, the sovereign fund or through the, uh, you know, the strategic reserves, uh, where are where are those metals going to have to come from, uh, if not the United States? Uh, because, you know, in the meantime, you're still competing with, you know, other parts of the world, say China uh, and, and such uh, for these commodities. Um, you're going to have to, you know, be looking to pay a, pay a premium in order to secure your supply, you know, in friendlier countries. Are you not? Well, very likely. Or, or, or you might, uh, you know, Trump is more apt to use tariffs as a sledgehammer, whereas a Harris administration, looking at her proposals, she'll still use them. She'll do it, I think, with a little bit more thought and more surgically, perhaps. Uh, which is what Biden has done. I mean, look, it, 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 when, when you get underneath the inane debate 
for example, that Trump and Harris had uh, a few weeks back, uh, which doesn't really answer questions, doesn't solve anything. You know, both came across, in my view, as very inadequate for the job. You know, you've got to start to answer the question, all right, how do we get these industries in the U.S., for example, reinvigorated to um, meet our own needs for what it, whether it's metals or manufactured goods or our infrastructure needs and and uh, transmission towers and 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 stations and and all the rest of this kind of stuff, uh, you know, because the place we're at right now in the electric vehicle industry is a good example. We are wholly unable as a country, and you know, isolating of course the U.S. We are wholly unable to compete with China when it comes to EVs. They have lower labor costs. They have lower cost of goods. They do it in some ways by cutting corners on things we wouldn't do when it comes to labor and environmental standards. Uh, but that, that that's the reality. And so what do we do? do? Do we do like Trump especially has suggested and slap 100 or 200 percent tariffs on things, including on Mexico, because some uh, Chinese EVs and other you know components for stuff that we actually do build here still come from China. They go through Mexico so as to avoid uh, uh, tariffs. If he cracks down on that, OK, what have you accomplished except to raise the price of the final finished good for Americans? That in and of itself is not a solution. It compounds the problem. And it still, without the right measures, doesn't put you as the U.S. in a position to be able to produce any of this. So, again, we're, we're, we're talking about all of these things very late in the game when all of these things should have been planned for and settled years ago. Now we're in a mess. Now it's not going to be clean. I don't care what the makeup of the government is to get out from this, you know, predicament that we put ourselves in, you know, despite the fact that Trump imposed tariffs on a lot of different imported goods, Joe Biden, for, you know, his rhetoric aside, and that of Kamala Harris as well, continued the majority of those tariffs added to some of them. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe it brought a few dollars more into the government, made the deficit less bad, but we still got a record trade deficit. So um, it's going to take a whole lot more than that. To, to fix this and to reinvigorate our domestic economy. And, and you know, again, there's been some general glimmers of, of maybe some guarded hope that we can have that they understand this. But as far as any details, you know, they haven't been forthcoming. And, you know, again, we'll see what January brings. Uh, part of that, of course, will be dictated by what the makeup does turn out to be between Congress and the White House. Will there be cooperation or will it just be gridlock all the time. Yeah, well, let's. We've you just uh, opened up two completely different cans of worms with the with those discussions. <laughs> um, you know, there's the you know the transition to a green economy, which we'll address uh, a little bit later. Uh, let's let's talk about the tariffs. Um, I, I will correct you uh, a little bit here. Uh, although Trump is uh, has always been the big tariff guy, um, it was Biden that actually put a hundred percent tariffs on uh, on Chinese vehicle electric vehicles, right. and that is uh, that has gone into place. But Trump fired the first salvos in the trade war with with China. And and started on the the tariff passage, and you're completely correct in that the Biden Harris administration has uh, really done nothing to ease those things. Uh, as we go into looking at the two sides, you know, Trump seems to want to escalate the trade wars, uh, as you'd mentioned. You know, even you know attacking you know stuff coming out of Mexico and. I got a question whether or not that can actually be done under the uh, the current uh, USMCA uh, agreement that replaced the old NAFTA agreement. But if Trump were to come into power and were to escalate a trade war with China, um, China's retaliation lately has not been to add tariffs to American goods. It's just, just simply say, I don't want to trade with you. Uh, you know, they've cut off trading in antimony. They've cut off trading in cesium, germanium. Uh, they're you know, limiting nickel e exports out of their country. Um, they have the ability to, you know, vast quantities of commodities that we need to build stuff. 
uh, does China just simply monopolize all of that? And, you know, American industrial policy uh, gets way late because they can't get the raw materials to build anything. Well, that could very well be, and that's and, and that's what I you know meant in part, Mike, when I say that we're we're rediscovering, if you will, mercantilism as a country at a very bad time when we've already surrendered so much of our advantage, so much of our ability to manufacture things and to go our own way. Now we're going to be tough when we've already gutted our ability to do all this stuff in in, in the last 40, 50 years. It's not going to work well. So, you know, again, tariffs are not the only answer. Uh, I, I think that the reality is that the world is fragmenting. You're not going to see global trade go away entirely, nor do I think should it go away entirely uh, for a great deal of things. But this is a this is a reality check that countries have to have, you know, in, in comparison to the U.S. and Canada, for example, and, and uh, your prime minister copied pretty much all of the recent tariffs that, that Biden put on Chinese EVs and components and stuff like that. The EU at least is having a slightly more honest internal debate. And that is, look, do we just want to hold our nose and buy these cheap imports and forget about how th the sausage was made? Because we can't compete. We don't know if we, at this point, we, we want to or have the ability to compete with much higher levels of cost for all these different things. Are we going to put that much of a wall around us? And this is something that, that you know, Trump has suggested in a ham-fisted way. Kamala Harris has suggested in a little bit more nuanced way. And this shocked me when I first saw the Biden announcement recently on this. You know, we all know with hindsight, and the Biden-Harris team should have known from day one, that when you give a subsidy to buy something that's unaffordable, you really don't solve a problem. So they had these subsidies for electric vehicles, helped to goose some of the early sales, but you're still using the taxpayer's purse to, to help pay for something that is just too expensive compared to the competition. So now the suggestion is, and this is interesting to see if this ever gets any traction, is it is a first matter the suggestion is being made that we subsidize the actual raw material producers. We set a price for lithium, for example, which has now crashed to a place where all manner of, of major projects have either been completely, you know, had the plug pulled on them or they've been delayed. We come up with an equilibrium price where everybody can make some money and you've got certainty of financing and whatnot. And we use that type of a regimen around which to build a more reasonably priced uh, but protected domestic industry for EVs. Now, something like that's going to take years to accomplish. But if that's the route that the a new government is going to take, then it's better than just slapping tariffs on, on Chinese products right now and, and, and still being in the same mess. So that, that, that was a, one of the more interesting things I saw recently come out of the Biden-Harris administration. Whether they believe it or not, we'll see come January and who they have to work with. But, you know, so it's not, again, you know, a problem half a century in the making, and that is the gutting of America's industrial capacity, our capacity to make things way beyond just sneakers and T-shirts and, you know, cell phones and things like that isn't going to be fixed in, in in a short period of time. It's going to take a while. And the question is, what's the right cocktail of policies to bring that about most quickly? And what do we do in the meantime when we still need some of these goods from other countries? So, you know, you know, I'm, I'm obviously an American citizen and I love my country. I don't always love my government. Um, and I want to see us succeed, but we put ourselves in a hell of a mess, and and uh, there there will be no easy way out of it, but there will be some workable ways out of it if everything is done properly. Yeah, you know, as you mentioned, it 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 is a really a more complex problem than you know a quick thirty second soundbite on a campaign trail is gonna yeah. is gonna resolve. Um, but yeah, the the tariff thing is 
something I've looked at. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's still a tax on, Ameri- on the American public because they're the ones that ultimately pay the tariffs on the goods that, you know, that are being imported uh, and otherwise. But, yeah, that did strike me. Well, as let, me a, let, let me throw this in, Mike, since you brought that up and my wife and I were talking about this the other night. And, you know, she's listening to some commentator about how Trump and then to a lesser extent Vance trying to, you know, defend this the other night as far as tariffs. You know, if I were a Democrat Party strategist, I would tell Harris or Tim Walls to, you know, the retort to Trump or Vance is this. You Republicans have said for decades that you want to lower taxes because if you increase taxes on corporations, all they do is pass that on to the consumer so you've got maybe more tax revenue coming into Washington, but higher costs of all these things because the corporations are going to pass on those higher taxes and other higher costs. What in the hell is the difference between that and throwing tariffs on stuff that comes into the country as far as the end result? There isn't any. And if no. they had any sense, either Harris or Walls would, would put it that bluntly. OK, and look, I'm not against tariffs in principle. OK, or if they're applied properly. But this idea is, you know, just one of several um, tax or tariff related things that Trump has suggested that there is no visible way to pay for. If that's your only answer, then, yes, all you have done is raise the cost for U.S. citizens for all these things you're slapping tariffs on. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. No, and and unfortunately, we seem to have failed to learn a lesson from history because it was the Smoot Hawley Act and the tariffs that resulted in that that prolonged the Great Depression in the 1930s. So, um, you know, le- you know, lessons from history. You know, it may not repeat, but it certainly rhymes. Well, I was part of it. Yep. Yeah, we're kind of in agreement with that, but I guess you know, just continuing at the same rate as opposed to uh, you know escalating a trade war, I guess is is a slightly better option maybe uh, than than the other. But yeah, like the, the tariffs, the tariff policy has never made a whole lot of sense to me. It's it's inflationary. It's a tax on the American people, uh, and so on and so on. Um, But let's take a look at taxes. Um, The Trump tax cuts, they're coming up for renewal here. Obviously, Donald's probably going to, you know, renew them if he becomes president. Have we gotten any indication out of the the Harris-Walls camp as to what they would do with those those particular tax cuts when they, uh, they come up for renewal? Well, Harris has said that if she has the ability to do it and has Congress on her side, she will not want those tax cuts renewed. Um, Trump wants them renewed. But here again, let's let's go back in history uh, as we did at the outset. When Ronald Reagan came into office, um, the annualized deficit was $40 billion. Okay. When he left office, it was well over $200 billion, and that was caused by a great deal of things. But mostly for purposes of this discussion, it was caused by the fact that while Reagan's tax cuts indeed led to an economic you know, good time, number one, assisted by the Federal Reserve softening interest rates after jacking them up through 1981, it, you know, revenues were not the problem. Uh, the problem was that for all of the talk repeatedly about Reagan, I mean, every time you watch the political partisans and Reagan and his budget proposals, it was like you, you're seeing the ad for some of the slasher movies back in those era. You know, Reagan is going to slash and gouge and 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 all this to the 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 government uh, the budget. He never did any such thing. He did quite the opposite. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but for every dollar of added revenue that came into the government, a dollar and a quarter more was going out the door for all manner of things. So this idea that Reagan was going to cut the size of the government became a joke uh, as time went on. And historically, it's an it's a you know it's a demonstrable fact that Reagan did virtually nothing 
to rein in the growth and the size of government, which has continued to grow over, uh, under every single president since then. And that was despite Reagan when he came in, bringing in J. Peter Grace, who was an industrialist, uh, to head up what came to be known as the Grace Commission, named after J. Peter Grace, but officially it was the president's private sector survey on cost control. And they came up after, I think it was 18 months, give or take, of all kinds of studies and this and that, of ways in which just by economizing and running the government more like a business, something like $430 billion could have been cut from the government. You know how much of it was enacted, Mike? Virtually none. Okay, now, an interesting thing, which people, if I'm sure, follow to some extent, is that uh, Elon Musk uh, has glommed on to the Trump campaign quite overtly, and Trump has suggested that if he wins, he's going to put Elon in charge of shrinking government down to size. I hope that this time around it's more successful, because that, as much as anything, will help the economy and, and make continued tax cuts actually pay for themselves in different ways. But the track record of Republican presidents cutting deficits is not good. No, no. And for the for the most part, it's uh, it's not much better on the other side of the house either. No. Um, you brought up Elon Musk. So this is probably a good time for us to transition into that uh, green economy transition. Trump has historically been uh, opposed to electric vehicle subsidies. Uh, you know, he tilts at the windmills, uh, very Don Quixote-esque, uh, and that they're killing birds and all sorts of uh, things of that nature. Uh, he doesn't seem to be a particular fan of solar energy as well. And part of the uh, the tariffs he wants to uh, apply on Mexico is uh, Chinese-made solar panels that are going to come across the border from Mexico. Is a Trump presidency the death of, uh, of the green transition? No, I don't think the Trump presidency will be the death of that at all. Certainly not in the tone of your question. The death of the green energy industry has been the the horrid lack of planning um that we had and, you know we we talked about it a few minutes ago in the context of not having uh trained labor and so forth look one of the things that we have at least as some benefit no matter what trump says which is electioneering and a lot of it bs no matter what harris says ditto okay both of them have track records both of them have been in a an executive branch administration, so we've seen what has happened. And on this subject especially, were I a Trump advisor, I would be hitting him over the head with a, with a baseball bat for making a fool of himself over so many things, including energy policy, when the fact is the Department of Energy under former Texas Governor Rick Perry, and then briefly when Perry stepped down, Dan Brouillette in Trump's first term, was the single best and most productive part of his presidency, where they didn't rule anything out, no matter what Trump might say on a stump about drill, baby, drill, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Rick Perry oversaw an all-of-the-above strategy, which before Biden came in, and frankly, in my opinion, ruined it and set the whole thing back several years. We had the beginning of a decent EV industry in the U.S. We had the beginning of a resurgence of nuclear power in the U.S. We had a lot of these things uh, because at least to some extent, there was a mindset under Perry at the Energy Department that we need to use engineering and math and economics and what makes sense. All right. Instead of having a situation where, OK, we want X percentage of vehicles to be electric vehicles just because that's our ideology. So we're going to compel that without having a game plan as to how to get all these things. And, and we have seen how that has worked because it hasn't. So the EV industry that some people threat, say that Trump is threatening has already been hobbled horribly by the current administration. Now, will Trump fix it? I don't know. You know, he 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 you know, 
it, depending on the audience, it's drill, baby, drill. Depending on the audience, it's, well, Elon is here. And, yeah, I guess EVs are okay and hybrids are okay in a certain context if that's what people actually want, which is closer, frankly, to what the free market is and how it should work. If, if, you, if, if there's a demand and economic sense behind it, fine. And I, I have no question in my mind that the EV industry is going to stay around for a long time to come. There will be ultimately a greater take up of EVs, but it's going to be more real. It's going to be based on economics. It's not going to be based as much, at least, on subsidies. You know, technology is making things better. It's bringing down the costs of batteries. It's bringing down the cost of the vehicles themselves. So I think they're going to be around. You know, I, I don't really put much in, in the Trump saying he's going to repeal the IRA, repeal a Green New Deal and stuff, um, you know, that, that that's electioneering jargon. OK, so it's all talk and no show, basically, uh, and everything should be which should be fine. And I don't disagree with you. Uh, the Biden administration has not been uh, uh, good on energy policy whatsoever. It's oh, stagnated now, a now lot here's of where, things. Here's and, where there is a risk, Mike. All right. And again, well, this is all speculation so far until we see how the dust settles after the election. There are several members of Congress who have said that if Trump gets back in and if, you know, they have the House and the Senate, that one of the very first things they'll do is repeal the IRA. Which in many respects was a badly thought out piece of legislation, but not in every respect. And if they do that, that's just as stupid and partisan as short-sighted as the harm that Biden has done in, in some respect. So, you know, you've got to get adults back at the table, okay? And, and I'll, I'll repeat this. I've said this before, and we've had this discussion. One of the most useful and, and prophetic speeches I've heard in my entire life in following politics came a good 20 or 25 years ago from Marcy Kaptur, who is the longest serving Democrat woman in the House of Representatives from Ohio. Um, great reputation over the years as kind of a you know meat and potatoes type Democrat, not all these social issues and whatnot, but it's all about jobs and unions and, and the public good and so forth. And when the work is done each day, when it's in session on the House floor, there's usually time left over for what's called special order speeches. And uh, everybody gets in line to sign up if they want to give some speech and have it in the congressional record for history's sake. You might want to talk about, you know, a little league team in your district winning the, the World Series for the little league. Or you might want to talk about the heartbreak of psoriasis or you want to talk about anything. You can get up, talk for, for five minutes, typically. And she got up and said, and this is again, 20 plus years ago, that the U.S. is courting disaster because we have no long-term energy policy. For the Democrats and the left, it's all about these starry-eyed uh, green energy ideals with no substance and economics behind them. With the Republicans, it's all about drill, baby, drill, no care for the environment, no care about diversifying the sources. We have no game plan. And she said that we need as a country to be serious and look at this issue in with no less urgency and no less money and no less commitment than the Marshall Plan at the end of the Second World War to rebuild Europe or Kennedy's space program. And to this day, we still have not done that. We've tinkered here and there, you know, more ideology than, than policy and workable economics. And we're we've only started to pay the price for that. Yeah, no, no disagreement on my uh, on my end. I certainly I look and I don't see a plan. So, um, which lends us to the next. Uh, well, let's uh, let's slip another question in here, and then we'll go we'll go about bipartisanship. Trump tends to be a bit of an isolationist. And if we're reaching the point where we're getting a bifurcated world where, you know, you've got East versus the West and we need to have more friends in our hemisphere, uh, is that going to be is that going to be a headwind for America to, you know, get some of the things that they, they need? Um, and 
the flip of that, have you heard anything from the Harris camp that suggests that they're, they're going to reach out more than what the Biden camp has done, which has been very little? Well, that's interesting. Uh, and we can go all over the place with that. You know, I, I have suggested for a long time that in an economic sense, the U.S. needs to dust off the Monroe Doctrine uh, from the pre during the presidency, of course, of James Monroe, when the U.S. was a young nation but starting to grow, still dealing with occasional, you know, pokes at us from England, which, you know, didn't like the fact that we threw them out once they came back again in 1811 and 12 time frame. Uh, the French were uh, at various times looking to try and, and grow the French part of Canada uh, and, and bring it back in some of the U.S. So, you know, there, and, and uh, with all of that, James Monroe basically said that, look, we all came over here from Europe to set up our own act in the new world. You stay the hell out. We're not going to mess with you in Europe, but don't you come over here in our backyard. And to me, one of the worst examples of how poorly all of this is planned out for our own economic security, for our own economy's sake, for our own strategic purposes, uh, as far as lording over, if you will, for lack of a better term, our part of the world, we should never have allowed China to set up as many ports and major trading relationships and whatnot as they did in South America. You know, I, I think one of the best things that can happen in years to come, and frankly, it would take someone like Trump to do this, is to sit down with, with the China, with the Russia and so forth and say, look, the climate do-gooders are already telling us that it's a bad thing enough so that we are mining and using all these resources. How much worse is it to ship them halfway around the world and burn up more fuel and contribute more carbon, et cetera, et cetera. You've already got a regimen evolving in the world of, of added costs and taxes by how far you have to transport certain goods. So let's do this. Let's figure out a way, and it's not going to happen overnight. We're going to figure out a way where, you know, and this is overly simplistic, folks, just for discussion's sake, so don't take this literally, okay? But the U.S. is going to, be in charge of North and South America, we'll be the big fish over here. China and to various extents, um, Europe and, and maybe Russia and India uh, will have Asia and Eurasia and Europe, and we'll figure out ways to equitably split Africa. Um, and again, I'm, again, don't take this literally, but I'm just saying this for sake of discussion. Because in answer to the original question, this is a major problem that we have in the world, is how are we going to resolve all of these things? When, you know, we're over in Africa, we're, we're, we're fighting China over influence in Africa. We're not doing a whole lot of that in Europe, per se, or in Eurasia. But uh, Canada's, uh, you know, a big deal. Uh, Canada is starting to have some of these impulses as well of wanting to shun Chinese investment into Canada, just like we are in the U.S. So there are equitable solutions to these things if the players want to solve them. My fear is that some of this at some point is going to actually lead to a much bigger shooting war than anything that we've seen. Um, and that's that's a clear and present danger. You know, Trump, I'll at least give him this much he thinks that by becoming a super mercantilist and cheapening the value of the dollar so we can not only produce more but export stuff to other parts of the world, he thinks that's how he's going to reinvigorate the economy and settle all the trade things. That is an overly simplistic, if not a fanciful notion. But at least he's he's thinking about how we're going to resolve these things. And he, unlike the Democrat Party, and this is a big distinction between the two of them, never used to be this way, he wants to do all of these things without the threat of war hanging over everybody's head. Yeah, that's one of the, the few things that uh, I think anybody could say nice about Trump was that uh, he's not a warmonger. No, I mean, he, for the he, most he, part, he's, he's, he's dabbled with it from time to time. But for the most part, uh, he, he, you know, 
he kept a lot of the powder uh, dry during his term versus Biden you know, has told the Navy to be ready for war with China by 2027. Trump didn't do that. No. Okay. And so again, I'm you know we're trying to be a little bit nonpartisan here. And and look, I I don't think that Trump is being realistic very much if he thinks that just by cheapening the dollar and being a mercantilist and yeah, reinviving, yeah, we'll, we'll have great growth, but we'll have we'll have double digit inflation again, but it'll be here to stay. <laughs> um that that'd be our price for doing it his way and avoiding war. Yeah. Well. Let's uh, let's set aside the two uh, the two presidential candidates for a second, and uh, talk about the other elephant in the room. Regardless who who's elected, they're probably going to be faced with a split house, where neither party has control over both uh, the Senate and Congress. Can the two parties get along to pass any legislation and and to solve any of these problems that uh, that's facing America right now, or is partisanship uh, so entrenched uh, that you know it just really doesn't matter who the president is? He got four years of inaction. If we have a split between the House and the Senate, there would be more harmony, and I'm not saying I, I expect or agree with this outcome, we would have more harmony if Harris was president than Trump. Trump, and, and he did a lot of this to himself, is so toxic to so many people. And, and you know, the Trump derangement syndrome is real, that especially if it's the House that goes Democrat, they'll, they'll spend the next four years of trying to impeach him over one thing or another, and there will be very little cooperation. Um, Harris, it would be a less bad situation. I, I said to you off, Mike, that a, a really interesting take would be that if the Republicans get both the House and the Senate, but Harris is president. Uh, I think that if you're a pragmatist and you're looking at what the outcome would be for the economy purely, and again, I'm not, this is not my personal preference, we're just discussing, that would be the best outcome for the economy. Arguably, it would be perhaps a replay of the Clinton years where Clinton, especially from 94 on, had to deal with Republicans on Capitol Hill. He went from a leftist to a pragmatist. And a lot of stuff was done that actually infuriated a lot of liberals back then. But a lot of stuff was done for business and for tax policy, et cetera. So, you know, we'll see. I, I, I want to believe that things can be done. There has been in the recent past, and I know you've seen some of this, there has been some movement particularly on permitting reform and certain other things that will help us to jumpstart our domestic industries for critical materials and so forth. It's not nearly enough yet, uh, but it's something, and it's something that has gone on with both Republicans and Democrats supporting it. So we'll, we'll see. Um, I want to believe that the severity of the downturn that's coming and looming shortages once more for various reasons of a whole host of things is going to finally shake these people into some more meaningful action. But, you know, time will tell. But th this country politically, Mike, is so split and so broken right now that, that no matter the outcome, it's not going to be easy. You have to look at it degrees, uh, you know, of things and, and what mix is going to be less bad. Yeah, sadly, uh, that's that's probably true. Where uh, I've always, as you know, as you know, I'm Canadian and I'm on the other side of the border, and we we watch you guys. Um, my observation is America has always been its greatest when it's had a common good. Um, you know, fighting the Second World War. Uh, you know, the the moon, the moon landing, um, things of that nature within its history where the America works together towards a goal. Um, that's when America is its greatest. And uh, over the last several years, it's been so fragmented. And it's been a, a shell of itself. All I can say is in three months time, <laughs> uh, we would like to think in five weeks time, but uh, the way your last few elections have gone, uh, the, you know, there's litigation, lots of extra vote counting and all that sort of stuff. But hopefully by the end of the year, we'll know uh, what the outcome of all this is. And uh, I thank you for joining me to uh, to discuss, uh, you know, things on a pragmatic basis and, uh, you know, based on what happens, what what we could see uh, going forward. 
Uh, if people want to continue to follow your work and your musings, Chris, how do they do so? Uh, simply go to nationalinvestor.com. I've got some similar content to the stuff that we've talked about, you know, on different policy differentials between the Republican and the Democrat government down the road, a lot of other stuff. Um, and I'm going to be adding more because, again, I'm going to be rolling up my sleeves and 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 looking a lot more into not only what both campaigns are promising that I think is positive, but also, and I'll give you one quick example, Mike, if, if, if you'll permit me just for a moment here. Um, besides efforts that you and I know of and support, you know, our, our mutual friend, David Tice, and the great job he did with his documentary, Grid Down, Power Up, about the vulnerability of our power grid, what needs to be done. Uh, Dennis Quaid, he did a phenomenal job of emceeing and moderating this documentary. You need to look it up, folks. It's critical uh, to understand this need. You know, our mutual friend also, Ryan Sistad, with Better in Our Backyard, you know, he's been covering a lot of uh, the broadening of understanding and support, which is starting to finally include more Republicans in this mix, uh, over what needs to be done for our national security, for committing reform and stuff like that. Uh, another cause that I would encourage people who are U.S. citizens like me to look up is look up the com uh, committee for a or the coalition. I'm sorry for a national infrastructure bank. This is far superior to President Trump's uh, suggestion for a sovereign wealth fund. In principle, it's some of the same goals, but this is a very well thought out thing. There are ways to have a public-private partnership that will generate scores of and scores and maybe hundreds of thousands of good, high-paying jobs for our mining industry, for our infrastructure, all these different kind of things without adding to the deficit. It's been done before in U.S. history, and it's frustrating to see all of the people running for office right now not understand that there are ways to do this without running up the debt. And if either Harris or Trump in the closing days would embrace this one thing and say, here's how we increase tax receipts, here's how we jumpstart economic growth, and here's why it doesn't add to the deficit, they'll win. And as Archie Bunker would say, case closed. That's a good final word, Chris. <laughs> I look forward to uh, chatting with you again soon. And, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, we'll have uh, reasons to uh, come back on uh, on again here before the election and uh, probably after the election while they litigate it. So uh, look forward to that. Me too. Take care, Mike. The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.